Hello, everyone. Welcome back again to the show. What a treat we have. Another, yet another, I search for these people, another incredible musician. And I use the term musician with all the meaning of the world because this is an individual who is a great improviser, just a really great uh, player, improviser. And, and I'm so pleased to introduce him. This is Nathan Mondry. Nathan, welcome to the show. Thank you, Nikhil. Uh, I'm going to be spending the entire rest of this interview trying to live up to the words of that introduction. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to. I mean, listen, I mean, uh, and again, I was telling this to uh, the great Professor Nicola Canzano. I was saying, why? it's always the harpsichord players and the early music players who have so much knowledge. And it's the particular kind of knowledge I really admire, which is the that basso continuo sort of orientation. I really like that because they're so straightforward with their information and they really get really amazing practical results and um and so nathan welcome to the show and could you just give a little introduction to yourself just very briefly we're going to get really deep in but maybe just just tell me tell the audience who you are what you what you do and uh yeah i'd love to know that yeah so i grew up in metropolitan detroit in a little town called franklin um Detroit, Michigan, I should be clear. This, this is international audience. <laughs> I shouldn't assume everyone knows where Detroit is. Right, but... no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, I grew up sort of a suburban household, um, liked singing from a young age, took piano lessons from when I was seven years old. You know, the kind of story where my older brothers were taking piano lessons. I wanted to do it too. And my parents didn't have to make me practice. So that was, I guess, you know, a sort of clue for them that, hey, maybe this one actually will will like going through it and, you know, going through the whole music education thing. What? What? So, how old were you? I was seven when I started. Seven. OK, lessons. seven years old. Great. Great. Yeah. Um, and Nathan, uh would you start out piano? Was so it was piano? Did you learn any other instruments, violin or or, or anything else? I I learned violin for about four weeks, and then <laughs> I decided this is too hard. I don't want to learn this anymore. It is a hard instrument. <laughs> it's a it's a very hard instrument. Uh, I was I was content throughout, you know, middle school and high school to play piano to sing. Um, I did like you know, high school musicals and plays and acted in those. Um, and then it was when I got to uh, my bachelor's degree at University of Michigan during that time, that was when I first really started to get into early music and earlier oh, instruments. Okay, so wait, let's take a little step back. So did you, um, okay, so I, I, I wanted to ask first question about uh, your early training. This is actually not related to training, but your ear. Do you have what is known popularly as perfect pitch or absolute pitch? Yeah, so the, the short answer is yes, but that it's much worse than it was, <laughs> you know, when I was in high school. Because when you get into early music and you discover all the different, you know, possible versions of what, a is in different systems and different countries in different centuries and different regions different you know towns one next to the other one's <laughs> different one town. organ is a different you know you get your brain gets and your ear gets so scrambled up that i couldn't i couldn't with any positivity tell you what a440 is really now. really it's not like I've, i very often very often now, when I give people an A, it's an A four fifteen because <laughs> Baroque tuning. I just was used exactly. So you know, uh, w once I hear it, then I then it's as if you know I haven't forgotten anything. Oh, so like okay, but, if you get a little refresher in your ear, will you suddenly will it be back to like normal? Yeah. 
Okay. Yes. It's so interesting. It's so amazing how some people can do that. So <laughs> it, it's uh, and so tell me how um did you notice? Okay, so how long did it take for you to kind of like get used? Do, are you the sort of person who gets annoyed? I mean, if you hear, I mean, obviously not now because of your training in early music. But prior to that, I've heard people with perfect pitch say, "Oh, I get annoyed if I don't hear it in the in the proper, you know, in A four forty. Is that? Did you ever have that sensation? Yeah, I had an adjustment period for sure. Um, I, there's another friend of mine who's a baroque violinist who had perfect pitch. And the adjustment for her was much, much more difficult because there, I mean, you literally have to, you know, feel those mm. notes in a way that for, I mean, a keyboard instrument, you're just slotting everything up and then it all <laughs> still fits in the grid. Right. So it, it, there was an adjustment, but it's, it wasn't, it wasn't like some decades long thing that I struggled with. Once, once, once you've listened to it and been in that world long enough, you did, you know, and, and how long, just, just a ballpark, how long does that adjustment take? I mean, it took me probably like a year. Okay, okay, and then just. But I mean, you know, it's, again, it's not really, it's not really like a problem for me now. Once I, yeah. once I know what what the gig is, what the instrument pitch is, like I adjust. It's not, it's not a problem. Have you ever wondered? I mean, like about your perfect pitch, like why it is and why some people have it. Have you ever thought about like the the just it just randomly seems to happen in a small number of people. Yeah, I have thought about that. I don't I don't know that I have any particularly uh eloquent thoughts about it, but I mean, I know that there was there was a period in my childhood where I didn't know that I had it. And then I wanted to like test myself to see if I could remember pitches. Mm. So like I would, you know, listen to a recording of some classical piece. I would run to the piano in the next room and see if I knew like what the chord was. I'd just sort of like do this for a while until, you know, I mean, how do, how do people like remember like a face perfectly and are, and are able to draw it? I think it's right. a similar sort of sensation, but just That's with true. the ears. Yeah. Okay. Um, now tell me about your, let's begin with the story of your entry into early music. You talked about it in your undergraduate. What, how did that all happen? Basically, because of my good friend, Nico Canzano, who uh, I've been best friends with since uh, middle school, high school. Um, he was a year ahead of me at University of Michigan. Okay. So I entered my freshman year. He'd already been there one year. He said, hey, I think I'm going to take harpsichord lessons with the harpsichord teacher here. I think you should too. And me, I, I played harpsichord at a summer camp like a couple years before once. And it was, you know, it was one of those experiences where I thought, oh, this is cool. I don't know if I'll ever encounter this again. <laughs> and then here I am. And then here I am, like, encountering it and falling in love with it. Yeah. And the rest is history at that point. That's that's interesting. And you really had that, 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 um, uh, that sensation where... And what was it about the harpsichord that really, like, kind of uh, was... That kind of you fell in love with what what aspect of it um you know above everything else the the fact that it is such an unstandardized instrument you know you grow up playing piano you're used to okay you go to an instrument there's 88 keys they're always white alternating with black there's three sometimes two pedals but it's you know it's fact it's factory standard you know and then I was just really into the idea of, oh, I could play four harpsichords one after another, and they could all be, all be different, completely different, <laughs> totally different. Right. And that was just, you know, fascinating to me. Just, you know, it part of it might have just been the, you know, the new energy of something that you haven't really spent much time with. But I, I don't know, the, the, the different colors of how they look, the different, the timbres of the actual sound of, of different plucks different you know there's different strings different numbers of notes different keyboards right uh all all these things that combine to just you know of course once you've studied them after a while there are there are schools of harpsichords and you you start to see the patterns but they're not necessarily so obvious from someone who first is looking at one and has never seen one before so wait, and this is showing my ignorance on the subject. So there are no factory-made harpsichords that just get churned out. As every are they mostly handmade? 
Well, so the traditionally, yes, they were handmade. Um, in a pre-industrial revolution sense, there were certain builders who we could say developed a certain system of building where, you know, they might have a bunch of apprentices and they like, you know, um, some apprentice will work on this part of the instrument, some apprentice will work on this part. Um, but even then, these are still, you know, radically smaller numbers of people working to build these things than, I don't know, whatever, a Yamaha upright <laughs> piano production facility. Right. Um, of course, in the early 1900s, when the harpsichord took on, like, was revived, and some people took on a more modern track with it, then there were there were sort of harpsichord factories. But in the in the in the traditional age of the harpsichord, from you know, whatever the late 1400s to the middle of the middle late 18th century, there wasn't really a harpsichord factory <laughs> mechanism in the same way there would would have been in the early 20th century. Right, right. Now I think what wouldn't it be just fun if we just started playing right away? I was just thinking maybe that would set the tone for the rest of the interview, right? So it might be a good idea. So Nathan. Just anything you want. I mean, it could be a few, it could be anything. Uh, I leave the floor to you. Well, you I mean, you had suggested before the broadcast <laughs> to do something related to our issues of having this interview related well, to internet connectivity. So the, how about the theme of robustness and strength, a strong connection, so to speak? I'm into it. Okay. Uh, just give me, give me a key. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, how about B flat? Okay. talking oh yeah that was so 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 good oh nathan oh, what a, setting the tone you. now now you said that you get inspired by a certain is that is that how how does that work so if somebody gives you a word or something how, how does that influence the choices you make well so i mean i because this is fresh enough i can do a little play-by-play -play yep. of, uh, of the thought process so you know you said the word robust so instantly, my first thought was big, fat, meaty chord to start out. You know, something with more than four notes, at least for sure, in both the hands combined. Um, so, and then robust, maybe that brings to mind French overture, something with, you know, a very like um, strong affect to it. Um, and then you mentioned French overture, then a few comes to mind afterward. Um, you know, maybe beyond that, it becomes much more subconscious. But th those are some of the, the the things that spring to mind when I first get a little burst of inspiration. Yeah, I asked um, uh, 
Professor Gonzalo Nico, I asked him, like, that's the, the big question, the thought process, because really um, it, it, it makes me wonder how far ahead are you thinking in the present moment as you're playing? So are you thinking, are you just like, let me get through this sequence and then I'm, I'm, I'm at a certain juncture, then I decide then what I'm going to do? Because you clearly have a lot of ammunition, so to speak, before you can go in different directions. Um, but wh- how far do you think ahead if you are making choices? So there's, there's, I would say there's two different tiers of thought. So on the one hand, there's the large structural thought of, okay, if I'm doing a French overture thing, I know that there's this, this dotted section, there's a fugue that's coming after, and maybe that's set up by either a tonic or a dominant chord. I don't necessarily decide that right at the beginning, but I know that once I've gone through enough of these little paths, those are the two goals in front of me. And depending on where I end up, one of those will make more sense to me. Right, right. So that's that's the that's the like the the background tier that's going on. The more like minute or second by second, phrase by phrase sort of tier. Usually, um, I have in mind like whatever, a two bar phrase, a four bar phrase, something that is on its like neutral form is a symmetrical number that then I can, you know, manipulate and twist and cut or expand as I want. But yeah, basically I'm thinking in a very like um, even numbered sort of phrases to, you know, let's say if I start in B flat, then okay, there's going to be a B flat major chord that's coming in two bars, or it's going to be an F major chord or some other chord that from the key that I start in, it's not, it, you don't have to think so hard to figure out what comes next. Now let's talk about, right. Uh, let's talk about phrases. Sorry to cut you off, Nathan. I just wanted to ask you, you mentioned phrases. What yeah. constitutes a phrase in your mind? How long is it? What are the elements that in, in you, is it like super long? Is it a small unit? What's a phrase to you? Oh, I mean, that's that's a widely variable question. But, you know, in the course of improvising, it's often determined by tempo. Actually, tempo is probably a big one because uh, if it's a very fast piece, I'm thinking in, you know, let's say four-bar phrases or eight-bar phrases and the, the harmonic rhythm, like how much the harmonies themselves actually change per bar also determines that. Mm. Right. So so if I'm doing something that is a slow piece in adagio, a largo something, and maybe there's anywhere from two to four harmony changes per bar, maybe I'm only thinking in terms of like a two bar phrase. Hmm. Um, but it's it's it, it it's greatly variable. I don't I don't have a, right. a, a one size fits all answer for that. Now, question. I have a little bit more detail in that question. So. When you do you make the phrase up on the spot and do you like say I'm in this particular chord and so I'm going to choose some some notes from the chord I'm going to maybe decide ah oh, it would be nice to decorate one of the chord tones I might add a passing note like how, how do you generate the phrase like what's your idea I mean that's a very broad question but like let's just take an example of a phrase like you're in B flat so like yeah did you I mean do you take it from literature I mean and then you say I have this idea and then I'm going to manipulate it to make it my own or on the spot, do you just say, I'm going to take, I have a chord in mind or uh, like a direction I want to take? I mean, there are, there are various, you know, stock and conventional choices oh. that I've encountered in music. I've encountered in repertoire. I've, you know, accumulated in practice sessions where on one level, it's basically like, even if I'm coming up with it on the spot, I've seen this scenario before, or I've seen that scenario. So right. in one in one in one level, it's a part of my brain that's just like activate this sequence now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or path you know A, path it's, B, yeah. Yeah. Right. So I mean in, in one sense, any good improvise I think any good improviser has probably, you know, truly never done something for the first time when they actually do it in front of an audience. Um, I know what a you lot mean. of times yeah. I know what you mean you, you're in treading a, some so you're treading old ground that you've practiced but you are in this moment kind of mixing them up though 
units, right? For sure. I mean, yeah. in, in a lot of ways, the 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 actual like sp- spontaneity mm-hmm. comes from you deciding what to put where and when, not necessarily the the like. Th- I'm going to reinvent the wheel. I'm going to reinvent right. the wheel no, 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 every, you, every single time. <laughs> right. Like it, I would say from my personal experience, like that feeling of actually feeling like I come up with something new happens. I don't know. Once every 20, once every 40 improvisations, like normally it's, I'm going to do something like I've done before, but it'll be in a different key or it'll be, you know, it's this sequence, but I'll try this figuration over it now. Yeah. I think um, you, honestly, I think you've been quite modest in terms of fresh, fresh, but like, but I mean, I get your point. I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Um, now, the, uh, one thing is, what's what's the answer to get many different, how, well, how do you build up your vocabulary is the, the real question here. Well, okay. So I let's, why don't I just take a little fraction of a sequence okay. and show you different ways that, you know, again, this is not in the heat of the moment, but yep. we can still look at it from a, you know, objective or or far back point of view so that yeah. we can see different possibilities can i choose okay. the sequence oh sure sure okay <laughs> oh my favorite it's everyone knows this is my favorite well i'm telling everyone now uh up four down five or down four or down five up four i mean yeah this descending circle of fifths is is a classic it's a classic um yeah the, you can't you can't go wrong with that sequence <laughs> literally i mean that i i the amount of improvisations that I've done where there's a sequence and if that sequence isn't in that is an extremely small number. <laughs> okay. And the so one let's, in the let's, minor, the minor is so beautiful. That's nice too. Yeah. Let's, let's stick with major just okay. to, to keep it relatively simple diatonically. Okay. So um, let's say let's, okay, let's do B flat major, right? So if this is our, Right. Okay. So that's our basic little element. Okay. We can do a version where the bass is simple and the right hand is doing some kind of scale thing. Right. That's one version. We could, we could take that and split it between the hands. We could do a totally different figuration like Or we could do something totally different. Right? There's, there's, I mean, it's, it's taking what is a very simple building block and just carving different, you know, little images on it. Do you have weaker keys and strong? I mean, that, I mean, everyone does, but like a guitarist hate D flat. And I mean, but like, for instance, like, uh, do you have keys that like you, you don't usually play as much? I mean, the harpsichord, maybe the temperament changes that a little bit, right? It makes that equation somewhat, it forces you, but it, are there keys that you're, that I just need to know, because it seems like you're so fluent in everything. Well, uh, I mean, I think in general, harpsichordists don't love to play in like, C sharp major or F sharp major, um, partly because of temperament, right? Those keys yeah. don't necessarily sound super in tune. Um, also, just depending on, sometimes it depends on the actual instrument because the keyboards are not always like um, built in the same sizes. So certain keys with accidentals are actually harder to play. Um, but, you know, I, I when I have students, I tell them, do everything in every key if you can, because it just it does make it does make it easier for when you have to you know right. improvise and someone gives you a key right. There's no reason there's no reason on a certain um, practical level to be afraid of any key, especially on what is you know a very grid like instrument with a keyboard mm. where everything is essentially just you shift up and down whatever amount you need and it's it's you just move the hands to the right place. Now there's there's who is it who said there might there's there's a lib, there's a certain number of schemes that are just defined by the base, and yet there's many keys to practice them in. There's many variations on each sequence. You can get quickly overwhelmed. What's a good what's a good 
like battle plan to kind of progressively learn them all? Is there, if you are teaching students, like how do they not get overwhelmed? Because you could just tell them, all right, these 10 things in all 24 keys, I'll see you next week. It, it's very, it's very tough. Yeah, it's a thing I struggle with a lot. Um, I mean, you could you could probably just spend a month on like circle of fifths flat word, and you know, um, number of my favorites would be descending seven six or ascending five six. That's your favorite? Uh, okay, show us. That's good. <laughs> well, favorite. They're they're ones that I think are are nice to do in the very beginning. Yeah. But I mean, so right, if we're doing the descending seven six, uh. I'm I'm a fan of that sequence. I think uh, it's very related in a lot of ways to circle of fifths flat yeah. words because you could you could do a version of that where um, you know essentially it sounds like circle of fifths but it's just alternating with first inversion chords, um, kind of anyway. Right? If you're thinking like. Da, 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 da. There's a lot of, I mean, there are, in I one sense, yeah, I see it. In in one sense, there are a lot of sequences, yeah. but in another sense, they are all just slight variations of each yeah, other. Yeah, like yeah, exactly. You're right. And um, I added another question with that, which is, yeah, who is the guy? This there had to be some. Why is it the case that people say Baroque music has no seventh chords? I mean, do you, do you, have you heard that before? I mean, I know I've not heard that, and it's very untrue. No, it's <laughs> I mean, it's very untrue. But uh, but I remember people saying, "Oh, Baroque music—they don't use many seventh chords. It's always like a lot of the harmony is simpler." Um, I, and and for some reason, that seems to be in in kind of a, a sort of because maybe what they're thinking is you know just like maybe like. C E G B and just holding it like that, you know. Maybe, maybe in some cases they, they they do that in contemporary music now, or you know, just those because they always like to think of layering things in thirds. But you actually hear that interval all the time, all the time, in nine sevens. Um, so yeah, I mean, if 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 we want to give that person more credit than they're due, we <laughs> could amend the state. We could amend the statement to say, generally speaking, we don't have sevenths that are unprepared hmm. right so like any any consonants can become a dissonance in the right scenario yeah right so like for example right that top voice which starts as a consonance becomes a dissonance and a seventh on that chord but that's because it's prepared hmm. yeah yeah i don't know so, i mean it's 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 something i've heard it's something it's 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 a weird one there are many weird ones. I mean, the other weird one is uh, figured bass is two things. It's only for the Baroque. It's only like uh, it's it's this accompaniment. That's it. It's this accompaniment in the Baroque. So that's the box that one. And the other one is figured bass is a blend of 19th century harm, harmonic analysis and, and that. So there's two kind of uh, weird kind of popular perceptions of the thing. But let, let me ask you something. Did you... Before early music, did you have a pretty conventional, like, theoretical training in North America? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, like, I, ever since I had piano lessons, I would have, like, you know, theory workbooks and things yeah. that I would fill out as part of my lessons. And it was it was all, you know, pretty standard, like, Roman yeah. numeral-based yeah. theory. Um, yeah. But to be honest, be, and partly because of my perfect pitch... I went by ear for a long time, and then it was actually learning basso continuo that allowed me to actually like understand the relationships in the music beyond just you know recognizing oh that's C E G or that's you know B D G. Wait, can like, you to actually understand? Can you expand on that? So wait, what was happening with your perfect pitch when you were doing the other theoretical analysis? So in other words, I I could recognize the individual notes within a chord and recognize them as that, but not necessarily know right away that's a dominant chord. That's uh you know, like these. I mean, these are things that these are concepts, of course, which come from tonal theory. But to actually like understand the relationships between different chords and different harmonies, and to know like 
okay, this is a sort of chord that happens here because rhetorically speaking, this is what happens right before mm. the end of a phrase. Right. Or this is, a you know, those sort of more like subtle differences. Yeah. Continuo helped me really understand a lot and, more. And how, how and, did it help you in that respect? Because it's reading from the base, but what does that mean with regard to your perfect pitch? Um, well, what it really means is, I mean, understanding like where phrases end and why phrases end where they end, right? So, I mean, one level of continuo is just the very literal, okay, mm. that's a C with a six on top of it. So that's a A minor first inversion chord mm. or, you know, <laughs> right? You can, you can understand continuo literally from that perspective, but it's, it's another thing to understand like, okay, so this phrase has been going on for three bars <laughs> and we know that there has to be a resolution coming soon. That's why the composer chose this kind of chord and not this other kind of chord because metrically it would like make it imbalanced or, you know, these, these sort of things that you pick up once you've like played enough of these pieces and you've seen enough of the things that, that composers repeat in the very in similar kind of scenarios. Right. Now, uh, I asked uh, Professor Canzano about um, the rule of the octave in our very first interview, not the... And he... Because he had such a rich basso continuo upbringing, it's it's almost like, yeah, that's kind of like a bit cookie cutter. And, you know, it's kind of like that's the... Uh, I And I understood where he was coming from because I think even in Durante, I think Peter Professor Peter Ventura was saying like, the, the, even the term rule of the octave is quite new. It's They had many ways of coloring and ornamenting and ascending and descending scale, not just one particular way. Of course, one became quite standard, Don Drew. It, 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 you see it in Don Drew. But can I get your perspective on like learning the rule of the octave, the topic? It's quite a popular one. So what, what, what's your perspective on that, especially when you're dealing with a lot of students who are new to early music? I mean, I do think it's useful. We can we can have a debate about how useful and to how many scenarios it actually applies. But, you know, I mean, the what I think is the most useful thing about Rule of the Octave is it teaches you how to improvise a scale when you don't have any figures. Hmm. Right? So, I mean, very often in the 17th and 18th century, you might have a continual part that someone gives you. Someone gives you a baseline and there's no figures, but you still have to come up with something that will sound good. And the again, I think the best benefit of the rule of the octave is it gives you a few different paths for doing that when you don't have any information at all that you can, you know, just copy from the composer. Right. And there's a few versions of it. I know like CPE Bach has a few all the Neapolitans, I mean, Fenneroli is a very famous standardized one, but there's there's a few. So, like, is there a particular one that you use or teach, or do you have any any preference? I mean, the, the Fenneroli one is is standard. Um, so it's generally one that I use. But, I mean, I, I, I like to alert students to the different versions. I mean, right. Handel, Handel has a different version where a lot of it is actually, like, for example... Um, in the position of like the second note of the rule of the octave, where very often it's a six, four, three chord in a lot of harmonizations, right? That kind of a chord. In Handel, and for the similar parts of the scale that have that same role where it's going to either the fifth or the unison, he will use just like a six, three chord. That sort of thing. Mm. Which has just a different character. It's a bit more... Um, let's say straightforwardly diatonic. I mean, the the weird thing about the rule of the octave, of course, is that there's like the dominant of a dominant feeling for a couple of those chords, right? <laughs> if we're doing on if we're doing on the C major on the way back down, yep, yep, that chord, yeah, yeah. which from a Why from a certain like, <laughs> yeah, that's the it's got a beautiful sound to it. It almost has the 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 the, the key of the dominant there, right? Uh, right. Yeah. 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 So that's, I mean, it's, it's sort of from a, from a tonal theory perspective is, is a bit, you know, kind of hard to, to put its place in, but functionally speaking, that kind of a chord, which is, 
I mean, we could call that a passing chord of some sort. Mm. It functions just the same way as, you know, like a leading tone chord would. So instead of to have, they both are fulfilling the same role, leading right. us to that next chord. Right. Now, speaking of rules, Basso Continuo, and I asked Professor Kanzano this pretty recently, ton of rules. It's long on rules, and even worse, it's long on examples of rules, too. So it's like there's a lot of things. There's a lot of information. I mean, this is a craft. It's an art, it takes time. It's a, it's, a, it's a craft. So what is your game plan with students in... Um, we talked about vocabulary, but this is more about the rules. I mean, CPE box, the true art. I mean, that's that that section on thorough base. I mean, that's tough. So, like, how do you how do you teach a student rules that's that's um, progressive and step by step and is uh, fun and you know all those sorts of good things? Yeah, I mean, there's there's different ways you could go about it. Uh, I think part of it depends on the student and whether you have the sense of is this someone who just kind of wants to get a taste of Basso Continuo, or is this someone who you think is going to be like <laughs> the rat. next Gustav Leonhardt, or I don't know. I mean, there's, there's so many different paths. Um, I, I, I like introducing students to um, Handel's um, Lessons for Princess Anne, mm. which is a very good collection of exercises that are both Continuo and composition-based. So, you know, some of the exercises in there is basically like a little excerpt of a piece where he will, um, you know, for example, he'll give you the motif for like a little fugal thing. The first voice will be written out and then he'll give you clues on how to put in the other voices. Hmm. Um, what's nice about his particular Basso Continuo exercises is there's actually very few words. It's basically like, you know, just exercise after exercise, like, okay, root position. Then you're adding first inversion. So in other words, like for the student who wants to get into the more fine details, then we can introduce other texts after that. But I think it's a nice way to just get people playing and not actually doing too much analyzing and overthinking in the beginning. In my, in my experience, mm. students in the very beginning, it's a, it's a crucial time where you have to make sure that they aren't, you know, well, that they're interested but that they don't think, oh, my God, how on earth am I going to climb this mountain of information? Right, right. I think in the very beginning, it's important to get them feeling like you don't have to have everything right away to still realize music and make it sound nice. Ah, I have a question that just came to mind, just like that, which is, how would you teach Basso Continuo to a young child? Like, let's say there's a kid who's interested in music, very, like, got some talent and, and is curious about Basso Continuo. I, I know from experience that you, you can't talk and talk and talk with a child. You have to, you have to play, but like, so like, what's your, how do you explain what's a five, three chord? What's a six chord? What, how do you explain these things? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I admittedly, I've not really worked on partimento or got continua with very young students. But I mean, but in a sense, like, like a beginners are kind of like kids in a way, even though they're adults. Right? <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, you know, the, the notation aspect of it is the first barrier that has to be overcome, yeah. right? To recognize, well, one, that like, this is a third, but by continuo literature, this is also a third, right? To recognize that like, the number, generally speaking, we're talking about continuo yeah. from like the middle and high Baroque. We're not talking about like Monteverdi, early Italian stuff, but when a composer writes, you know, okay, they write a six above a, conti you know, a continuo note to know that the six doesn't always literally mean the sixth above, but could mean the 13th above. It just depends on what octave you want to play the note mm -hmm. because in continuo nine, occasionally a 10 is typically like the highest figure that mm -hmm. we deal with because all the other versions are repeatable in different registers. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it really just, it's, I mean, I would say the first barrier is just to have them recognize, like, what it means to play an interval above a bass, and then to recognize that to have that interval be in a particular register above the bass can still be expressed by the same type of notation. Yeah. What's, in your, as a teacher, what's the most effective, um, and you, I'm sure you know what works, what doesn't work, 
what what have you found really effective in teaching basu continuo you mentioned uh handle that's a great but i'm i'm thinking also uh in terms of explaining it to a student is it is it just like handle lots of exercises just do the exercises not not, not so much talking no i mean it's uh, of course it depends on the age of the student it yeah. depends on how how many things you think they already know i mean always there's some assessment that i have to do with the student you know yeah. see do they know how to play in different keys? Do they do they know like what tonic and dominant harmonies are? I mean, in, in many ways, you could just, you know, boil it down to that in the beginning, making sure they understand like some chords are like the goal and some chords are the chords that get you to the goal and to like feel the difference between those chords. You know, I mean, it's again different with every student, but sometimes you could just you could just spend in the beginning like a ground bass, which is a great way to teach um, a progression, but also to teach variation, to teach you know how you take the same material and do different things with it. Right now, um, now we we talked about beginners. Now you're clearly, I mean, like it would be a shame if you like it was. We only spent this 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 time talking about uh, one one demographic. But now, let's say you had an experienced person coming to you and say, I've done lots of accompaniment, but I don't really know how to take it to that improvisation level. Uh, how would you take it from the chord playing to a more, you know, into more improvisation territory? Well, I mean, as I'm sure you've probably discussed with other guests, I mean, Partimento is a great, sort of, you know, gateway in between, let's say, paperless memory inspired improvisation. Let's we we could say on one level, maybe that's like the the highest standard that like we think of when we think of an improviser. Someone who doesn't have any visual aid at all. They're just going on like internal feelings mm. and, you know, shapes that they can come up with. Right. So generally in my in my experience, when that oftentimes a student will come who is very gifted with playing an instrument. They have all sorts of repertoire. They have experience with Basel Continuo, but they've just not done the next step of like making pieces up on their own. Yeah. Um, so Partimento is great for that because it's it kind of gives you both. It's a piece that already has a defined structure mm. and has some, but there's not, there's usually not just one solution. There's often, you know, even within, you know, a standard solution, there can be layers of difference in terms of actually realizing it. Right. Um, so, you know, I think Partimento is a great gateway into that. I mean, also just making people compose is, I think, a very important part of it. Sometimes, you know, improvisation is just fast motion composition. Yeah. So now, I have once... to... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry, Anthony. No, no, no. So it's just, you know, part of part of, a lot of it comes from self-esteem. And some a musician feeling like, well, I can play all this music, but I can't come up with anything on my own. Yeah. So you have to sort of like, you know, feed that that malnourished plant inside of them so that they can actually feel like, okay, I can create music. It's not rocket science. There's, you know, you just have to be aware of a few things structurally and make it, you know, if it's a piece that exists in a certain meter and a certain phrase structure that it all just kind of like fits. Right, right. Now, listen, we, we when people talk about Partimento, we talk about Partimento collections and all of that, but this is so awesome. I mean, you write your own Partimento. I mean, what level does that have to be? That's got to be a few levels above, like, I mean, writing your own Partimento. People are dying in book one, and here you are writing, writing your own Partimento. And I want to draw the audience's attention to your wonderful IMSLP page, it has you're a composer. You compose lots of pieces, but I, let's let's talk about the Partimenti you've written. Now I see there's a Ritonello one, con, a Concerto Partimento, a Fugue Partimento. Yeah. Uh, maybe we, let's. Would you mind? Should we take a look at some of them and maybe you could explain your sure. Partimento? What could we could we start with actually one of the unpublished ones I sent you? There's this um this versetto. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Let, let me let me bring that up. And why don't you just describe it while I'm bringing it up? Yeah. So this is um for for lack of a more refined way to say it, this would be like you know 
a beginner's first kind of a like fugal partimento is, is sort of the the pedagogical aim I had in mind. So a piece which is, you know, it's got imitations, it's got a, a very small subject, um, it introduces different clefts, um, not so much in the way of of sequences per se, but it's it's just a, it's just a you know small compact piece to get someone comfortable with partimento language and notation so here it is and uh, right okay. so very, so very v- right very often in these um imitative genres of partimento it's all written on one staff and sometimes you know there will be the introduction of the second voice on the staff that introduced the first voice right so we see that in the first line and then we see that there's a tenor clef at the end, which is, a, you know, a clue for the performer that, okay, here's where the next voice comes in. And of course, once you've played enough of these kind of things, you know that <laughs> the piece doesn't, the piece doesn't go like this. So I'll, I'll go from the beginning and I'll okay. show you how not to play measure four. Okay. So from the beginning we have... Right, so you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to complete the two voices okay. that come right before that. So, right in this case, I would choose as my solution something okay. like this. Right, so the G sharp mm-hmm. resolves down to the A. The B natural resolves, or I should say, the G sharp resolves up to an A. Mm-hmm. The B natural resolves up to a C natural, so that when measure four comes, the two voices are still continuing, right? And the idea of, of, of this sort of a notation is to basically show you that, um, you know, to come up with a fugue and express it in one voice can often be understood just from continuum figures. You don't necessarily need to keep track of everything that you would think when you think of like a Bach fugue or something with a very long fugue subject where you think, how are they putting all those things together? (laughs) No, the idea is that it's actually very simple. And it's basically that, you know, motifs, melodies, subjects, they are ultimately a linear expression of harmony. Right, right. So I I could, I could, for example, now do a complete version of this piece and just show you how, how this might go. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. That was great. Wow. Actually, you know, we actually have a bunch of slides that that we prepared. I told see, this is the thing. Once I get talking, I, I forget our game plan. So <laughs> I get, we gotta we gotta we get let's get back on track here. So that, that's great. We have actually a bunch of great examples that we should talk about. Uh okay, let's let's do the invention partimento then. Okay, let's let's pull that one out. Okay. So okay, so give a description of this one now. Yeah, so this is this is very much um, inspired by Durante, um, right? There are the different partimenti where he will often give you, um, like, you know, the first couple of measures and say, this is the basic way to do this piece. Now you do the rest. And so I've given, I've given an example of how I think the opening should go. And since it's um, an invention... We are expecting the voices to trade off, right? So to show you the very first line and the little in chip it that I've given. (laughs) 
Yeah, it's just, like, supposed it's just to... like Durante. He has that insipid, right? <laughs> that's cool. Right. And so that's that's supposed to be enough to tell you how to figure out the rest of the piece <laughs> if you so want. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, you know, just just to basically say that like this is a lesson in invertible counterpoint, right? The thing that you can do in the right hand, you can do in the left hand, and the thing that you were doing in the left hand, you can do in the right hand. It's also a little exercise in showing you how to come up with, well, transpositional things, right? To recognize when there's a sequence and to know that, oh, the thing that I was just doing in the half bar before, I do in the next half bar, but down a step. Like, for example, uh, where I just stopped, right? I stopped, I guess, the, the beginning of measure six. Right. So, right, if we if we had from the beginning, then that becomes in the right hand. That part of the bass line switches. And then, in my opinion, since I wrote the piece, I can say that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, then this, this little 16th note figure that we just had comes back mm -hmm. and then I think you're supposed to do that for the next another bar and a half and then we have another little sequence here so that some you know you as you as you go through these things you start to discover okay certain things are more strict about what we're supposed to do which right. is essentially mm -hmm. when there's the actual statement or the counter subject. And then there are passages in the piece, which is usually in between those moments where it's a bit more free what you decide to do. Right. Right. Especially when you get to like cadences, like in measure 10, I, w I would say there's not an obvious solution for what to do, right. but um, maybe you could draw on your previous lessons and throw them in here. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so for example, right. In a lot of ways, what's what's the purpose of a cadence? It's to affirm the key that we've just ended up in. So, you know, if I was if if I had my partimento student here and I was advising them on what to do in measure 10, I would say the idea is that the the right hand is probably going to end up on a G by measure eleven downbeats. So that could be expressed in all sorts of ways, but let's say, for example, right that's a very comfortably standard sort of solution that you could do there you could also do something where you mix a bit of the the 16th note figuration that we had before culminating in a trill and it's basically you know i mean Again, I, I don't. I didn't design this piece to be played only one way. There are multiple solutions, and as long as it's more or less an expression of the implied harmonies, mm. and the subjects and counter subjects appear at the right places, and you cadence well, you're gonna make me happy. <laughs> Pass. You get an A. Why yeah. not? Why don't you? Why don't Nathan? Why did you go through the whole thing? I mean, it sounds great. Let's let's go through it. Sure, I'll 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 come up with a version.
Awesome. One take, ladies and gentlemen. One take. Look at this guy. This guy is awesome. Okay, Nathan. <laughs> what? What should? We, okay, we should we tackle the the concerto part of Mento? Oh, we could, or we could, or we could take a little fugue interlude. Okay, want to go into some of those subjects? You want to do the the part of Mento fugue A four, fuga A four, or is there another one? Um, or, or I meant even just improvising fugues from some of the different subjects I gave you. Absolutely, that sounds great. Let's do it. Yeah, let's take a look at this. Louis Couperin subject. Oh, okay. Um, um, I can even so, okay. This is a subject which, let's say we could do in, in something like a minor. Uh, 17th century, you know, is it this tonality one? versus... Yes. Okay. Yes. So tonality versus modality in the middle of the 17th century is a complex subject. But let's say that I'm going to improvise a prelude non measure which just basically means a prelude um un, an unmeasured prelude so in that sense this is a type of um prelude notation which it's all expressed in whole notes because the idea is the actual um rhythms that you would want to introduce as the performer there's some there's some fluidity with it but very often in these louis couperin um preludes there's an unmeasured prelude which surrounds a fugue in the middle. So I will do a little prelude with a little fugue in the middle and we'll see what happens. Okay.
so good. Woo! Nathan. I tried to... I tried to throw in some a pedal entry for you there. <laughs> I don't know if you could tell. But. <laughs> I, I heard, and I also heard my, my my favorite sequence too. I heard a lot of things. There's, I mean, so good. I, Nathan, Nathan, there's a couple of things I want to ask you. So, for instance, um, do you, in the repertoire, do you know, and have you played a lot of fugues yourself? Like, does the, have you played many, many fugues? Or is a lot of it also theoretical, like you constructing it in a lab? Or do you do you do you like do you need to know? Basically, my question is: Do you need to play a lot of fugues to be good at fugues? It seems like a ridiculous question, but I mean, <laughs> yes, I think so. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, maybe there's a version of of this where someone has only like studied fugues and not played them, and maybe they could then do it. But I I, I would view it as unlikely. Um, I don't know. I've probably read at this point in my life hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of fugues. Right. Um, so, you know, and that might, that might just be Bach. Like, <laughs> we, we include other composers, too. <laughs> and, no, and, I mean, I think I, yeah. I think a very important part of if you want to, in whatever fugal style we're talking about, if you want to do it well, you just have to devour lots and lots of music so that, right. it, you know... You're right. We're trying to we're trying to reconstruct a language that people aren't speaking, so right. to speak. So you have to, you know, immerse yourself in it to really feel like you can become fluent in it. Uh, as a question I ask all the improvisers, which is how has all this improvisation knowledge and the skill affected the way you play uh, repertoire? So how do you it do, does it? I mean, was there a point? That's a, I never asked you this, but were you always an improviser? Like prior to the early music, were you always kind of improvising? Was that something you just always did? Um, when you, I'm in classical music, everyone plays repertoire. It's just a given. But with this, armed with this knowledge, do you find that you just approach it differently? Yeah. So uh, I, I did. I would plunk around with certain things when I was younger. Uh, I don't think I was particularly good at any of it. Um, it was it, I didn't really like have this more, let's say, focused approach to like improvising in styles until, I don't know, some some point late in my undergrad, I started to get into it. Um, I mean, I, I did a lot of, a lot of my very thorough training came in the course of my degree in Basel, which for a couple of years was was in improvisation. So I specifically, you know, overdosed on a lot of this stuff. <laughs> um, but as, as far as how it affects playing repertoire, yeah, I mean, it, it, it would be hard for it not to change how you view repertoire afterwards. Um, like you how know, so? I mean, I, well, so, I mean, this is probably also because I'm a composer, too. It gives me a certain license when I'm looking at a piece of music to respect it but also not treat it as if it's some like sacred text which is how i think a lot of people approach mm -hmm. the the score when they play from you know <laughs> right exactly and i think i think i think one that's not a, it's not even if you feel that way about a piece of music and you feel it deeply in your heart when you actually play from it i think that's not a great attitude to have i think it's it's just as important to recognize um you know, basically you go through a piece and you realize the points where a composer could have done something totally different. Mm. And they might have done it the way they did because they didn't like the other possibilities or they wanted to just put something down as a place marker and, you know, trust that the performer would know what to actually do with it. Yeah. And that involves, you know, that involves a certain, a certain confidence to be able to one, you know, there's a there's a name that you recognize and a piece that you recognize, but there's still a part of you that thinks, well, but I can bring something to this that someone else might not have. Um, so I don't know. I think I think it it gives you a certain um, just more flexibility with a piece of music and to recognize that the goal is not to, um, I don't know, like I I'm, play. I'm yeah, I'm so I'm so with you. I'm totally with you. I'm amazed we can say it today. I mean, before you had to say it in hush, 
you know, in closed doors, you know, you had to say that you couldn't, you, the way we're speaking, we sound like radicals, you know, it's, it's unbelievable. Now the mood has changed and I'm so happy that someone can say it now and, and no one's going to bring the pitchforks, you know, it's unbelievable. I mean, it was hostile. Let's be honest. It was so hostile yeah. in, in the, well, first, you know, I, the 20th century, I, I, bizarre behaviors. Absolutely. I think, you know, I think a very big part of this is just like, well, we've had the recording industry going now for a good, you know, 100 plus years. And I think on a certain level, people are tired of hearing the same great work played a certain way or recorded by 20 of the greatest artists of their generation. You know, it's not enough anymore to just, yeah. oh, I'll do it and I'll be the 21st person to do it this way. Yeah. Like, no, it demands, you know, we're in a new era. People can, you know stop listening to you for five, you know, in five seconds, if they don't like what they hear right from the beginning. Yeah. Uh, people can go check out this type of music or they can go, you know, go do this activity. I mean, music doesn't have the the place of being the, the prime form of entertainment that it did 200 years ago. Right. Right. So I think that demands, you know, from us as, as performers and people who, you know, present programs to the public it demands a certain, you know, level of, of, of freshness and creativity that I think before was, was, you know, suppressed to some degree because it was, it was viewed as, you know, you're, you're doing work that's, that's on the side. That's not what you're mainly should be focusing on, you know? Yeah. I'm I'm just grateful that all those, I'm grateful that all those hours that I potentially wasted actually turned out to be useful for something. <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, it's, it's, it's a start of something new. I really believe something is, is happening. Now, here's a question I have regarding HP. Um, uh, do, is there an American style of realization uh, versus a European style? Uh, this was brought to my attention quite recently. Uh, some Europeans would say, oh, you, this is a very American way of improvising or American way of playing interpretation. And uh, also, you mentioned Basel. Could you also just mention who you studied with and the kind of things you did over there? Yeah, well, okay. So to get to, get to your first point, um, yes, I've been told there is an American versus European way of doing these things. Yeah. I don't know how much validity it holds, but yeah. I have been told that. But, and been told that about my playing too, that... When I was in Europe, I played like an American. Um, you know, I think also I have been told in the past, sometimes when I wear a certain artsy hat or something, <laughs> that, I, that I must that I must know jazz, you know, <laughs> and the way that I play shows that I'm a jazz musician. So I don't know if it's just a catch all for like American continuo means that they're like jazz players in disguise or something. I have no idea what it actually means. <laughs> Um, but yeah, and so in Basel, I st- my my main two improvisation teachers were Marcus Schwenkreis and Emmanuel Um Okay, Marcus Marcus, I wor- worked on harpsichord improvisation with, and with Emmanuel, I worked on organ improvisation. Okay, and what did you, what did you what kind of like lesson plan was it? And what did you guys work on? Oh, I mean, there's different things all the time. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the goal of the program is that you you prepare for a, a final, like, master's recital, right. which in my case involved a mix of original composition and then different improvisation tasks. So, like, you know, there was this, someone handed me a fugue subject and I improvised a prelude and fugue. Um, I did, like, Based. a biblical... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. I did. I did. I did on the organ. I did a biblical sonata improvisation where the day before the recital, I was given like verses of of text that I then had to like fashion a series of movements off of. It was it was in this case Noah's Ark. So I had wow. like a little. So there's a little a deluge about, in your piece. <laughs> oh yeah, there there was a flood. There was a flood movement for sure. Yeah, <laughs> that's um, so cool. So, I mean, you know, just, you know, you, we would focus on different things. Like some, some, sometimes it was just on like concerto improvisation. So like taking a ritornello theme that could be pre-composed or come up with on the spot and then, you know, improvising different interludes and things, um, worked on sweet improvisation. So, you know, sometimes that would involve 
writing a bass line for an alaman the quran the saraband and a jig now you're, that's a, that's a you said a s u i s u i t t e yeah not a sweet improvisation that's a different thing right no not s w e e t but i'm sure it was a sweet improvisation too <laughs> <laughs> okay so yes well so yeah go ahead no no, no. so so i mean that that actually has some I mean, in, in in historical improvisation, some of the methods that are used are more speculative than others. Um, when it comes to sweet improvisation, there actually is um, this guy, Neat, spelled N I E D. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, you've you've come across that name. Yeah. So yeah. he he published this Musikalische Handleitung, which is a I mean an all encompassing treatise of many different things. But he has a section on yes, exactly. So he has a section, uh, and I believe that would be in book two. Yeah, in part two, okay. where he basically shows you how to take um, a baseline. So he he provides a baseline that you then can manipulate to become an alaman of Quran, and he goes through all the different wow. dances. And so that's that's a method that you know I've used with students before to you fashion a baseline and then basically you know the characters of the different movements inspire you to make the appropriate metrical and you know whatever harmonic changes you need to make right. now nathan as we wrap up i wanted to ask like you know so much but is, are there things that you're working on are you like oh, i need to work on this this week or i mean are there things that you are like i need to learn a bit new things well, what are the sorts of things that you're like working on that you have on your diary well yeah i mean i listen i'm always working on fugal improvisation um you know that that can always get better <laughs> um and that if i've i've noticed that you know sometimes if i go a month without improvising a few the, the first few times i go back and doing it it's terrible it's horrible like i really just you know uh, just like anything you know if you don't do it all the time you lose it mm. um I don't know. Um, some things that I've, I have been interested in in the past that I would like to get back into is, is some more um, Renaissance style improvisations. Um, there's this guy, um, Santa Maria, who um, he published um, a treatise in the 16th century on different sorts of composition and improvisation related tasks. One of them is how to, to improvise a Fantasia which I had spent a, a good time in Basel working on, but I would like to to bring that back under my fingers. That was, I mean, that was pre-Basel Continuo. Yes, yep. yes, pre-Basel Continuo. But, and so a lot of a lot of the things that you have to memorize in this, there are, he has a, I mean, basically like different sorts of progressions that, again, you learn how to do them. You learn how to do them in as many different keys as you can, different modes in his case. Right, right. Um, but all all fun, useful stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's that's wonderful. Well, we should end off with some music. What do you think? What what should we want to pick sure. one of those one of one of those subjects? Yeah, okay, sure. So I did a French one. Now we we can pick an Italian one. Okay, there's Carole, um, Car uh, Car Carelli, Alboni, Albini, Albinoni. <laughs> Which one do should we do? Here, let's 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 do this uh the second Corelli subject, which is which is very fun and I think might be recognizable to some people. Oh nice. I'll just okay. play the subject. I'll play the subject really briefly and then I'll do a prelude and a fugue off of it. But so <laughs> So that's that subject. Um okay, so prelude and fugue.
ridiculous. Oh, uh, <laughs> I, didn't get to the, I didn't get to the fugue. You, you didn't get to the fugue. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, fugue. fugue. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. I just was, so, I love that's, that. That's what we're all waiting for, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow, that is that's so good. I mean, this is why I have the show. It's for myself. I just I felt like I got better just listening to that. <laughs> that's amazing. Oh, that's that's way too nice of you, but <laughs> oh, thank you. Oh man. I mean, what was I doing in my early music education? I should have been exp- this I should have been exposed to this from the beginning, from the beginning, beginning, beginning. And you know what's funny? You know, I went to a contemporary school, you know, a jazz school. And I remember there was a great teacher. He passed away recently. His name was Barry Harris. And he said, and it was funny, in one of his DVDs, uh, his famous workshop DVDs, this is a jazz teacher, right? And he's, he's, he turns to the group and he says, you know, what we really need, what we really need is we need one of those old figured bass teachers because that's what we really need. <laughs> and he said, and he said, um, he said, you know, people say they're so old, but they're too old and all of that. But no, that's what we really need. We need figured bass. And and, and again, I mean, like, look at look at the fruit. <laughs> look at look what's happening. This is awesome. I mean, this oh, is- I, I mean, yeah, you, you can you can draw a direct line from my first basso continuo lessons to today for sure. Basso continuo is king. It's awesome. And and as we as I end off, I would just want to say, I mean, obviously, I mean, people are going to be gobsmacked by your playing, and if Nathan, if people want to take lessons with you, how are they going to reach out to you? Here's your website. I mean, I mean I'm mean, i surprised you're not famous. So here we go. This is it. <laughs> here we go. Nathan Mondry. So you have a website, but, but, but you're working on it, right? You're building it up. Is that right? Yeah. So my, my professional website is a bit of a work in progress. This is my, this is my web page okay. uh, on the Department of Music for Cornell University, which okay. is where I'm currently a doctoral student. Great. You can uh, email me at my address, which you it's can down see here, underneath. I think. Yeah, right. Yes, here. that anyone who's interested in having Zoom improvisation lessons or lessons of any sort with me can email me through that. I mean, ridiculous. I mean, it's it's obscene. I mean, I'm saying this is another path that I want the audience to be exposed to. Know that it exists, and if you want to take lessons, the people are around. You know, 
And I'm telling you, Nathan, I'm going to go practice right after this interview. It's so inspiring. <laughs> <laughs> so inspiring. That's very nice of you, Nikhil. Thank wow. you. Wow. And do you want to plug anything? Is there anything you want to mention? Upcoming concerts or workshops or anything you want to just mention uh, to my audience, things you're working? What's your plan for the next uh, year? Well, next year, I don't know if I can think that far in advance, but... I have some local concerts here in Ithaca, New York for the next couple of months, giving giving an organ concert on Wednesday, which I hope to record. And if I do well enough, put on YouTube. Um, so I have my own YouTube channel. Ah, I, have I some found pages. it. Yeah, here we are. Okay. Yes. Uh, there's some of my own pieces on there. You can also check out music of mine on Spotify. Right. Um, Let me bring that up. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, different albums on Spotify. Um, one with um, my group, Les Barracudas, from Montreal. We did an album. Um, another album up there I did with Eric Tinkerhess, where we did, we recorded the complete works of Forkere for Viola de Gamme on harpsichord. A couple other of my compositions that are on there as well. Um, and I'm working on an album a solo album to release within the next year. That's awesome. Wow. Well, uh, well, the great, I mean, I can say that the great Nathan Mondry, everyone, um, please keep doing what you're doing. And, uh, you know, actually I had an idea for a panel interview with your good friend, Professor Canzano. That would be awesome. I think we, we could certainly, I mean, I, 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 time is short now, but we definitely have to have you back again, Nathan, and, and talk about more stuff. There's a lot more to cover in this wonderful world of early and I know early music, that's the genre, but really, I mean, the implications of this, if people are really, if they really understand what's happening, I mean, it's not, I mean, yes, it's the genre of early music, but the system, the, the, the it's people from jazz can understand, can get it. There's something here that, that is a powerful system that people are neglecting and it's, and it's applications are, are enormous. So um, I, I'm just so excited to have you on the show, and uh, I hope to have you back again, Nathan. The great Nathan Mondry, everyone. Thank you so much. Talk to you soon. Thanks, Nikhil. This is a thrill. Talk to you soon. Thank you.